The 20th Conference of Parties of COP28 has concluded in the United Arab Emirates and there was a lot of discussion specifically on words, words and phrases like phase-outs, transition, mitigation once again, capturing a lot of uh, the media attention, an incredible amount of discussion taking place. The, as the conference concluded, there were all kinds of views, many countries expressing happiness over the fact that there was some commitment on transitioning from fossil fuels. Many others, many critical voices from across the world, especially the global south, saying that what has been achieved at this conference is definitely not enough. And, you know, we are still uh, staring at disaster. To discuss some of these issues, we have with us D. Raghunathan of the Delhi Science Forum. Raghu, thank you so much for talking to us. And let's get straight into the most, uh, you know, the most discussed bit about uh, this conference, the most interesting bit, which is that the conference text talks about a transition from fossil fuels. Now, many countries had talked about the need for phasing out or phasing down. Uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, on the other hand, were strongly opposing that. So, can you maybe explain this debate and what this transition really means? Uh, in the first place, uh, viewers should know that, uh, funnily enough, uh, ever since the discussions on climate began way back in 92, uh, we all know that the uh, climate change uh, is caused by accumulated greenhouse gases, the most prominent of which is carbon dioxide. And we also know that roughly about 90% of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been put there because of burning fossil fuels. Right. So while we have been discussing the problem of global warming for now close to three decades, uh, there has never been a specific mention of fossil fuels in the COP debates. You've talked about emissions in general, even though all the measures being taken by people to reduce emissions, a large majority of them are to do with fossil fuels. You are shifting from uh, uh, oil-based power or gas-based power or coal-based power to renewables. That means you're doing away with fossil fuels you're moving away from petrol burning uh, vehicles to electric vehicles. Again, you're moving away from fossil fuels. So this is an obvious fact. But funnily enough, it has never been operationalized or recognized formally in the COP discussions. Right. So this time, the issue of fossil fuels came center stage. There was some discussion towards that at COP26 in Glasgow where there was a mention uh, specifically in the declaration to move away from uh, coal-based power. And that's where India had strong uh, objections. The conference had to be postponed, the closure had to be postponed by a day because India did not agree with that uh, phraseology and finally accepted a compromise formulation saying we will phase down coal-based uh, power rather than phase out yeah. because India thought phase out would mean no more coal and India which gets majority of its electricity from coal because that's the resource we have uh, objected to it saying then what are we going to do <coughs> this time the two major changes are that the COP declaration calls for a transition away from fossil fuels all fossil fuels. So it doesn't differentiate this time between coal and uh, oil. It says transition away from fossil fuels. But then if you look at the finer uh, print, uh, there is a differentiation made. I'll come to that. Uh, the point you made about Saudi Arabia and the oil producing states is that they wanted no mention of fossil fuels as such, but wanted to speak only about emissions coming from fossil fuels, uh, which would give an out an escape clause that if you can manage to somehow make usable petrol or usable natural gas by trapping the carbon dioxide, not releasing emissions, then you can go on using fossil fuels. Right. Uh, so that was the reason why the uh, so-called petro states were getting agitated about that and they tried very hard to uh, lobby for excluding uh, fossil fuels. But then the declaration goes on 
to talk about different aspects of fossil fuels and there provides for a large number of loopholes which is what the oil producing states and oil producing companies uh, wanted so there is a provision for uh, allowing the continued use of uh, transitional fuels right. which for the europeans and the americans is code for natural gas Uh, which is a fossil fuel uh, of course then there is talk about low carbon hydrogen which is code for hydrogen made uh, from uh, gas sources you trap the carbon dioxide but use the carbon dioxide to drive the production of uh, hydrogen so there still will be some uh, release of carbon dioxide but not as much Uh, as earlier then there is so called low carbon uh, oil uh, with the uae for example and the cop president represents the uh, adnoc the abu dhabi national oil uh, company they claim that the oil produced from uh, abu dhabi has the lowest carbon dioxide content of any oil produced anywhere so all these kinds of niceties are being introduced in order to give an alibi for the continued use of fossil fuels under the pretense that it we will reduce the carbon coming out from that and there is a special clause under which carbon capture uh, utilization and storage ccus is mentioned and the problem again is there is no definition in any of these technologies blue hydrogen low carbon oil etc to say how much carbon dioxide is being trapped is it 80% is it 90% is it 20% there is no definition so tomorrow the oil companies can come back and say yes we are doing carbon capture but we are capturing only 20% 80% is still going out so unless you had defined what these meant there is no point and apart from which carbon capture and storage even today has not been proven commercially anywhere uh, in the world there is no viable uh, demonstration of a technology to shown to be commercially uh, viable and as i said one doesn't know how much carbon dioxide etc is being trapped so my reading of the entire transition thing story is there is some good in the sense that at least a transition away from fossil fuels has been mentioned mentioned right. but there are too many loopholes uh, given which will allow for escape of countries and oil producing nations oil producing nations claim why are you only looking at us we are only producing the oil the bulk of the utilization the burning of the oil is being done by those who drive cars in other parts of the world and so on blame them don't blame us so they are saying this is not a supply problem this is a demand problem right you look at the demand uh, and that is one and the irony of course of all this is that the us europe are all continually even today engaged in fresh exploration of natural gas uh, deposits the uk is continuing to issue licenses for natural gas exploration in the north sea and has said that every year new licenses will be opened they have so far issued 170 licenses for exploration of natural gas in the north sea and they claim and this is the unimaginable part they claim that all the natural gas that they are going to find is a step forward in decarbonization of the economy and their argument the reverse of the saudi argument is that this oil extracted from the north sea the production will be counted in our uh, count of emissions but the more we import then it will reduce and we will import we are producing this but we will sell this abroad and then we will import from elsewhere so there are all kinds of twisted logic being given to justify the continued use of uh, petroleum and uh, natural gas and we will have to see uh, going down the road how much of this transition 
actually occurs. But uh, that I think is a lesser problem. Uh, we will continue to face that because let's face it, no economy in the world except very small ones are able to really transition away from fossil fuels at this point with the technologies at hand. Maybe after 2030, 2035 or 2040, you will be seriously able to see uh, a transitioning away, but those will have to await, I think, future dates. But the uh, employment of the huge lobbying potential this time, there were lots of noises made behind this uh, curtain in front. European Union said very bad, you know, this is not good enough. We should have a, a mention of moving away from fossil fuels. The US also said that, but behind the scenes, they were pushing for all these exceptions, which would give them loopholes uh, to do. Incidentally, a small point which some commentators and journalists have noted is that the presence of uh, oil companies, uh, fossil fuel companies at the COPS has been steadily increasing. And last time at Sharm el Sheikh, which is in Egypt, not really a petro state, but still a state which relies considerably on oil uh, extraction. Uh, there were 600 delegates from oil companies. Uh, and this year at uh, Dubai, there were 2000 delegates from oil companies, larger than any single national uh, delegation, the largest of which was from Brazil, which had 400 delegates. Uh, at the COP and the oil companies had 2000 delegates and many of them are also have been taken as part of the official government delegations of many countries, right. which means that they are sitting at the negotiating table uh, as oil companies, but uh, as official representatives of their governments. So there is increasing concern that the oil companies are now becoming a central part of the negotiating uh, process itself. Uh, this is like, uh, shall we say, uh, cigarette manufacturers being part of discussions of uh, how to deal with cancer or arms manufacturers sitting in a disarmament conference. Uh, this is close to that. Absolutely. In this context, I also wanted to ask you a bit about <clears throat> the global stock take. That was one. That was to be one of the highlights of this conference because it would give us a sense of where we are in concretely dealing with climate change. So, what has that exercise produced? Yeah. So, as you will recall, in our earlier uh, uh, interview that we had uh, here, there had been uh, a process of assessment. The stock taking process has been through a, a series of three technical dialogues, which has gathered all the information etc. from elsewhere and they have put out a report as inputs into COP28. Uh, the COP28 uh, declaration, which is now called the UAE consensus, um, incorporates exactly the same numbers that are given in this stock take, which says that uh, if we are to attain 1.5 degrees C, then we should reduce compared to 2019 levels we should, we should reduce globally uh, emissions by 43% by 2030 and by 60% by 2035. So that target is now fixed into the COP uh, process. The difficulty is over the next year, year and a half, all countries are expected to review their NDCs, mm -hmm. their emissions commitment, which has been given in light of this information and come back to with higher ambition uh, commitments to reduce emissions by middle of 2025 and say in June of 2025 so that by December 2025 COP30 uh, will then give a stamp of approval to all these NDCs that the countries have submitted, just like was done at Paris. So these will be the new NDCs. The problem is, just like at Paris, there is still the open question. These are all voluntary commitments. So countries will table something. India will say we will reduce by so much. US will say we'll reduce. Then somebody has to sit down and do the math. 
put all these together and figure out does that make us reach 1.5 or not? Or is there still an emissions gap? I had wanted and hoped that this COP would spell out some methodology by which that happens. Right. Otherwise, we will be doing exactly what we did at Paris. People come and give voluntary commitments. And then you sit back and say, whoops, this is not equal to 1.5. If you go by these, we will reach 1.8 or 1.9 or 2 Celsius. So I had hoped that this COP would make a move by spelling out some methodology by which we would ensure that the voluntary commitments given put together will take us to 1.5. Maybe the intention is to, during the year, have negotiations, have discussions at different levels, but it would have been good if there had been a discussion at this COP of some methodology. One methodology which was suggested way back, 10, 15 years ago, even before Paris at Copenhagen and so on was that all countries, when they sit together, they will table their commitments. You can quickly do the math and see where it is uh, going. Then you will say, no, this is coming to 1.8. So go back, come back the next day with a revised target, but don't leave the conference table until you hit 1.5 uh, Celsius. So some such methodology, if it had been spelt out, I think that would have given a sense of optimism on this score. Right now, we are uh, on a vague thing. You know where your target is, but uh, you have no definition or methodology worked out of how we are going to reach that target. Right, Raghu, I just wanted to bring up the question of finances as well. Many countries pointing out, of course, that uh, there's all of this big talk is there, but there's really no money on the table, resources are really what is lacking. Like I think Bolivia is believed to have said that all there's all these great declarations, where is the resources? So did this COP make any difference that way? None at all. None at all. Uh, in fact, to me, that was the uh, equally, if not the bigger disappointment. Uh, big moves on emissions, uh, COPs are not very famous for. Uh, but at least... We hope that some further advances would be made on finance because the um, uh, loss and damage fund was finally formally uh, launched at this COP on the first day uh, itself. But they were gathered pledges from different countries, totaling up to only $700 million, uh, of which the United States, the world's richest country, has made the great donation of $20 million uh, as its contribution towards the loss and damage uh, fund. So clearly, countries are not, uh, developed countries are not coming up with the real money. The same thing applies to adaptation. The same thing applies to helping developing countries in the transition away from fossil fuels and towards green energy. Uh, there were supposed to be contributions toward that as well. The global stock take had come up with some numbers and estimation of what the scale of funding is required. What is the need uh, for money? And you will be astounded at the numbers. It goes between 300 to $450 trillion per year. The original commitment made was that the developed countries would come out, come up with $100 billion by the year 2020. They have fallen short of that. Uh, although there is a claim here that they are almost reaching that number, but others who have crunched the numbers differently say that only $20 billion of public funding uh, has been made available. The rest of the money, let's say $60 billion, $70 billion are all tied to debt. Right. They are loans. So developing countries who are supposed to be helped with transition are given money, but on loans which increase the debts that the developing countries have to pay back. So it's a double whammy as far as the developing countries are concerned. You give them money on the one hand and take back uh, a large part of it as uh, debt uh, servicing. And those, those uh, paradoxes remain those contradictions remain in the present structure. There is no categorical distinction made between 
पब्लिक फाइनेंसिंग डेट फाइनेंसिंग प्राइवेट फाइनेंसिंग एंड डिवेलपमेंट एड मैस्क्यूरेडिंग एज क्लाइमेट फाइनेंस the idea of climate finance was it should be distinctively aimed at climate change but all the developed countries give some uh, development assistance uh, aid to developing countries they are showing all those also as uh, towards climate financing so i think this is the old problem which i had been raising with you in our discussions uh, here that you are asking the developed countries to give money you are giving it different names mitigation funding adaptation funding loss and damage funding but it's all the same money coming from the same pocket uh, so there is a limit to what is going to come and the developed countries we all know are not exactly philanthropic giants uh, sitting there waiting to give away uh, free money uh, they will extract their pound of flesh one way or the other the only problem is that uh, the money that they are even pledging to give is nowhere near uh, what is required if it is 300 trillion dollars uh, that's a thousand times more than what is on the table uh, now and uh, so that's just a mirage uh, there and i think that discussions on that front will of course continue but i don't have too much hope uh, on that i think a lot of uh, lobbyists civil society organizations and others they have spent a great deal of political capital of time energy in pushing for greater funding they have a commitments on paper but i'm afraid that uh, claiming victory uh, is kind of um, uh, a little difficult to swallow uh, in the sense that one should claim victory if we can see the money on the table right. and that has not happened certainly at cop 28 and on that uh, unfortunately gloomy note thank you so much ragu for speaking to us for explaining really what was at stake at cop 28 and what has been achieved uh, for some changes some improvements in the language need to be mentioned of course but the larger picture the larger issue of climate change very much still staring us staring at us in the face this is news click and people's dispatch thank you for watching and we'll come back with more videos in the future